I will bring my attention from the front part of the head towards the back of the head. And I've been doing this for years and I didn't even know what it was about. But the primitive part of the brain, the reptilian brain, is the brainstem. This is not the thinking mind. The thinking mind is the front. I want to get out of this. If I do light and slow breathing and really slow down my breathing to the point that I have a subtle air hunger, I find it's almost like a mini nap. Patrick McGeon, welcome to Denmark. I better get your names first, guys. Mads and Jacob. Jacob, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We better start again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. What are you doing here in Denmark? And nice to meet you in person for the first time. It's. Yeah, likewise. Last time was by Zoom, is it? Yeah. So yeah. it's quite and different in the flesh. It's always Very. a bit awkward because of the. Yeah. But it was fun last time. There was a good energy, I felt like. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It was fun. And, and you know, extremely you're good, good at explaining it on a level so. Everyone understands it, I feel like, especially because you both are much into it. Mm. Um, I am a little bit, but not as much. So I think it was really You're helpful. the rookie. Yeah. But I think that's also why it's good for many people and they yeah. follow you is because you get to, you're really good at explaining it on a, like a, on a practical Basic level. level yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it has to be that way. You yeah. know, like I remember sometimes I give the example of, I was at university studying economics and mm. it was this maths teacher. And he was brilliant at maths. He was a genius. And he would cover the board with all of these equations and algebra. And he was so good at maths. And none of us had a clue what he was talking about. Mm. And he found maths so easy. And he expected us to students to be able to pick it up the same way. And I was only thinking about it about six months ago. I would have loved to have had a maths teacher who really struggled. Because in order for that maths teacher to be able to explain the ins and outs and the step by step of how he got from A to B, for that maths teacher, then he would be able to convey that to the students and especially the students who were a little bit slower in picking it up. So I think breathing is the same, you know, breathing was a struggle for me for years. And plus, I suppose I'm in it for quite a long time. And I think the simplicity is really, really important. Yeah, I believe it's like Einstein who said that if you can't explain a theory to a child, then you don't know what you're talking about. Something like that. And yeah, oh, I guess there's some truth to that, right? Totally, yeah. totally. And especially, you know, like when people talk about healthcare, the words can be very technical. And I would have ran that, you know, issue back maybe 15 years ago when I was talking about something and over complicating it. But with breathing, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, you can keep it as as simple as it as necessary. Mm. Yeah. How 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 can we keep it as simple as possible for the general well, public? You can talk about breathing. You can break it down into three or four main areas. One is what's functional breathing. What's dysfunctional breathing? Now, when I talk about that, I'm talking about our everyday breathing patterns. And the best way to think about good breathing patterns is first think about how would you breathe if you get into a stressful situation. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that when they have a challenging situation, their breathing changes. Does their breathing become faster or slower? Breathing becomes faster. Is it higher or lower? It's higher. Is it irregular or regular? It's irregular. Is it harder or lighter? It's harder. And is it effortful or effortless? It's effortful. So, you know, when we get stressed, our breathing is faster, harder, upper chest, irregular. Um, there's an effort involved, but it's often through the mouth. And that's those are the same traits for dysfunctional breathing. And it's not just a stressful event that's changing our breathing patterns. If we are breathing that way, we are going to react very strongly to a challenging situation. Like if the body is already under stress and next com thing comes a challenge, how are we going to react to that? And I think we all know that because, you know, in our own work life, You will have employees who are good. They've got good coping mechanisms regardless of the situation. And you have other employees that if there's a challenging situation, they just freeze. You know, they just can't deal with it. But we have to ask, the situation is the same, but the person's reaction to it is different. And what's driving that difference? That's not just about personality. I would have been the individual who would have went into a fight or flight response. 25 years ago before breathing or a freeze response, I could never think straight when I got into a difficult situation. I didn't have the capacity to be able to 
to self-regulate. I didn't know the connection between the body and the brain and how my everyday breathing was telling my brain either that I'm under threat or that I was safe. You know, so I think every human being, I think we have the right to know that our breathing pattern conveys a lot of information to the brain, but we, we can use that to our advantage. But most people are not, they don't know about this. And then you think of people who are more susceptible to challenging situations, people who do have a tendency towards racing mind or anxiety or panic disorder or high stress. These individuals are unknowingly feeding their active and anxious mind all the time because of a, an underlying breathing pattern that nobody is telling them. Your breathing is too hard, too fast, irregular breathing patterns, your mouth breathing, your breathing upper chest, and all that is doing is driving you into a state of anxiety. Who is saying that? Like if a person goes in and it's not that the person is having a panic attack, it just means that your breathing can be a little bit faster than normal. Like a respiratory rate during rest of over 16 breaths per minute for an adult is too high, simply. And I would even go as far as saying 14 should be the upper limit. But what was the upper limit 20 years ago was 14. Now, what's the upper limit is 16. And I'm even hearing 18. Yeah. 16 is too breaths high. Per, what, per minute? Yeah. Breaths per minute. So and the respiratory rate. What is the ideal? I believe James Nestor says around five and a half breaths, right? Well, is that's... this is, yeah, this is interesting, Maz. This is not how, this is not about breathing every day, though. Okay, so, so it's not the default breathing state. Correct. Mm. But what researchers did find over the last 30 years when they were looking at heart rate variability in terms of how do you bring the body and mind into a state of balance? Because we don't want to be too relaxed, but we don't want to be too stressed either. We just want to be balanced because when we're in a state of balance, then when a situation comes, we're able to deal with it. We're able to react to our environment better. So to help to bring the body and mind into balance, when you slow down the respiratory rate to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute, for maybe 10 minutes a day or 20 minutes per day, that would be really good at helping to bring balance to the autonomic nervous system. It improves vagal tone. It helps to strengthen the pressure receptors in the blood vessels, the major blood vessels, which in turn is feeding into how balanced the body and mind is. So, like, I will say this just before. It's not just about focusing on six breaths per minute. Because I was doing a radio interview a month ago and one of the listeners rang in and she says, I do slow breathing, but I get lightheaded. And of course, I said, well, the reason being is because you are doing slow breathing. But as you slow down your respiratory rate, the tidal volume is increasing disproportionately so that the volume of air that you are breathing is too much. And this is reducing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. So counteracts it. So yeah. correct. We need to have a conversation that with breathing, we have to consider it's not just about the respiratory rate. And this is where society, breathing instructors are so honed in on the respiratory rate. Forget about the respiratory rate. Let the respiratory rate sort out itself. That The respiratory rate will, will find itself based on your chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. What I mean by that is if you have a good functional breathing pattern, you have reduced chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide is the driver to breathe. You've got a good tolerance of the gas carbon dioxide. Your drive to breathe isn't too strong. And when your drive to breathe isn't too strong, the respiratory rate finds itself. But the research over the last 30 years was focusing on between 4.5 breaths and 6.5 breaths per minute. Correct. Why? Because it's easy. Mm. You could bring in somebody in off the street and you can say, I want you to practice breathing in for five seconds and breathing out for five seconds. And we want to test that. Anybody can do it. So that's why the researcher honed in on that. But that's that's just a part a of snippet. it. Yeah. Mm. So I just want to bring it back a little bit. You said that the uh, normal understanding of respiratory breaths per minute changed from 16 to 18 times per minute. What, what do you mean? Like the, yes. the I would even say it's changed, Jacob, from 14 to 18. When, when I was starting on my breathing route, um, I did a lot of the initial study in physiology because I really had to get my head around it back in 2000. So it's 24 years ago. And I can remember what I learned back there. And I can remember that carbon dioxide in the blood, normal carbon dioxide ranged from 37 millimeters of mercury to about 44 millimeters of mercury. That was the range. 
And the respiratory rate was about 10 to 14 breaths per minute for an adult. And tidal volume was a half a litre. So that was normal. Roll on 24 years later. Carbon dioxide now in the blood ranges from 35 millimetres of mercury to 44. So in other words, the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, which is regarded as normal in the population, has lowered. And of course, the carbon dioxide in the blood is determined by the carbon dioxide in the lungs. And the carbon dioxide in the lungs is determined by how heavy you mm. breathe. So that's why... So it could be stress-induced or I, lifestyle. I think modern society yeah, has yeah, changed. Yeah. And that's probably why we have more like the stress of it is what brings us breathing but is it i mean what how's the cycle with that because sometimes for instance if i'm in a stressful situation uh and i know these things kind of not as much as you and 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 you mass but sometimes i feel like it's my heart that starts pumping first and that will kind of like start the little bit okay shit you know but then the heart to me is what feels like it start pumping in some situation and, and it doesn't really feel like the breathing but how does it work like uh you know it's both it's both it's both so it, it, like it's a good question and i don't have the perfect answer is it that your heart rate is speeding up or what's driving your heart rate typically it is your respiration but the heart the cardiovascular system and and the respiratory system are tightly interconnected the cardiovascular system does affect your respiration, but the respiration has an even bigger influence on your cardiovascular system. Mm. But, you know, like we could feel stressed and next thing is our thoughts are agitated. And this is, of course, going yeah, to repeat yeah. the emotions. Hormones, yeah. And our breathing is going to speed up a little bit. And it's not that you're having a panic attack. You know, we can trigger a stress response just by slightly faster and harder breathing. It's so, so subtle. It goes both ways in terms of what comes first, I guess. The it's, thoughts, the yes. heart rate, the, the respiration rate, you know, it kind of changes depending on the situation. It is. And the interesting thing about your heart rate is it is a good indicator of, of when we feel stressed, whether in sports, going in to do a presentation, anything that we are doing. If we have an elevated heart rate, now, the thing about an elevated heart rate and elevated breathing is that the brain then is interpreting that there is a threat. And of course, the brain wants to protect you and the brain wants you to get away from the situation. So it's not a time to plan and to make decisions and to give your presentation, because even though you're walking into the room with your physical body, your brain is saying, get the hell out of here because it's about survival. However, we can use this to our advantage. And this is a trait that should be taught to all kids and all teenagers and all adults. Any time that we notice that we are getting stressed and our heart rate is getting elevated, we can simply take a soft breath in through the nose and a slow, relaxed and gentle breath out. And even by doing that for 30 seconds, and you could even do it now, you're just taking a soft breath in. You don't even hear it. So it's the silent, as a, uh, silent of a breath. And you can bring down your heart rate and also put the critical mind aside that you're going into that situation and you're going into that situation in a state of a state of no mind, but a state that you are going to give and to deliver, whether it is a sporting event or a presentation, with your ultimate quality of performance. Your physiology is in perfect balance and your mind is in perfect balance. And we can learn that. And that would be in flow, you know. And I would have to ask, like, why is it that people talk about in flow, but how many people can reproduce it at the flick of a switch? I can reproduce it. And I'm not any abnormal, like, I'm just a normal individual. All I did was learn breathing techniques. You know, like, I have a talk tomorrow, 400 people. I talk for what, six, seven hours without slides. So I will talk freestyle for seven. I don't like PowerPoint presentations. I want to connect with the audience in the absence of this big, white, big screen. I want to connect and eye to eye, you know, um, and I will, I will make sure that I am prepared and that's, I will have my routine. I will give my routine to everybody tomorrow because this can really get us out of trouble. The routine that I always have is number one is energy levels is very, very important. OK, so say, for example, if I'm flying, which can be a little bit tiring and the traveling and everything else, I always want to make sure that whenever I get up in the morning, I am conserving all of my energy for an event. 
I don't want to waste energy unnecessarily. We have to realize we only have so much energy and we can have decision fatigue very, very easy. I will keep everything very simple. And a lot of the time, it could be for a half an hour or one hour. I would simply sit down, I would close my eyes, I will bring my attention from the front part of the head towards the back of the head. And I've been doing this for years and I didn't even know what it was about. But the primitive part of the mind, the primitive part of the brain, the reptilian brain is the brainstem. So this is a chalk-like structure, chalk, chalk-shaped structure that connects the brain to the spinal cord. This is not the thinking mind. The thinking mind is the front. I want to get out of this. And I also find that by bringing my attention towards the back of the head, that if I do light and slow breathing and really slow down my breathing to the point that I have a subtle air hunger, I find it's almost like a mini nap. Because when people talk about getting up in the morning and the first thing you have to do is upregulate, no, forget about upregulation. The first thing you have to do when you get up is to make sure that you have the energy levels. And what I mean by that is if you were waking up and you're just feeling, yes, you were flying or you were doing this and you didn't have quite a good night's sleep, you're in a hotel, there's bangs, doors banging during the night. It's not about upregulating then. It's about conserving energy. It's almost about catch, catching or extending your sleep time. But I don't extend my sleep time by sleeping. I extend my sleep time by conserving energy. And I do that for about 40 minutes to 60 minutes, whatever is necessary. Now, if I'm too downregulated, what I do is I will do some breath holds or I do physical movement and I do breath holds and physical movement with the mouth closed to upregulate. So, but I think the mistake that people make is they often say, well, do a hyperventilation breathing exercise in the morning. That will upregulate you. No, not if you're after having a crap night's sleep. If you've had a crap night's sleep, you need to sort out your sleep. And also, if you do feel lousy when you wake up in the morning, don't start hyperventilating. Start downregulating. Does that mean meditation? I mean, what you're talking yes. about, is that what other people would be like, okay, meditate when you wake up? It is, it is and it isn't. Um, of course, meditation is my interpretation of meditation because I'm not formally trained in mindfulness. My interpretation of Anapanasati or just meditation would be bringing my attention out of my mind and onto my breathing. But very often the rules, I've done some Vipassana courses, the 10 days of noble silence. The instruction there there would be don't change your breathing patterns. But I don't agree with that. And the reason being is because mindfulness originated maybe 2000 years ago. Yeah, It's, it's a long time on the go, but society, life is so much different then. Now we have a problem of chronic stress. And I think it's fundamentally very important that we actually do change our breathing patterns, that we not by forcing our breath into place. It's having the observation on the breath. And of course, when we are observing the breath, our attention is out of, their, out of our heads. We can't think and have our attention on our breathing at the same time. But it, also with that, I want to have my attention on my breathing and I want to be gently softening and slowing down my breathing almost to the point that my breathing disappears. Now, you could say, well, that will happen in meditation. Yes, it will. But how long will it take for it to happen? Too long. I want to go straight to the source. If I've got five minutes, I want to tell my brain that I am safe. And all I will do is simply close my eyes bring my attention inwards, shift my attention towards the back of the head, onto my breathing, slow down everything, and I will spend five minutes saying, just conveying, using it to my advantage, you know, that, yes, for my body to tell the brain that I'm safe. And when the brain interprets that the body is safe, then the brain will send signals of calm. Now, people might say to me then, well, you're going to go out on stage and you'll be too relaxed. No, I won't be. The problem is that many of us go out on stage, we're too elevated. We want to bring ourselves down to normal. Does that make sense? And there's a time if you feel really sluggish, the problem with sluggish then is not about upregulating. That's about the conservation of energy. I want to take a quick break to acknowledge one of our sponsors, Swedish Cold. This thing that I'm sitting in right here is the most amazing spaceship I've ever seen. Swedish Cold doesn't just produce ice baths. They produce the most revolutionary cold exposure experience that's out there. Not only is it stylish, but the running costs are low, the water freezes fast, and the water temperature remains at zero degrees Celsius all year long. So whether you're a health-conscious individual like me, 
a gym owner or you run a facility, then this state-of-the-art ice bath would be a perfect match for you. For me, this is one of my favorite habits. Not only does it boost my testosterone and my dopamine, it also elevates my core temperature and it helps me manage my stress levels. With Swedish Cold, you're not only investing in a piece of equipment, you're investing in your future. So head over to SwedishCold.com and remember to use the code HOLISTIC10 to save 10% off your next ice bath. Okay. And when you do these exercises... Um Two things. Will you breathe all the way down to your lower part of your stomach or will you still stay up here only chest? And will you be sitting up with a with like like normal meditation with your spine upright or would you, can you be lying down and you can do it in any position as okay. possible. There's for me I often feel that when we think about meditation and mindfulness and breathing exercise that it comes with so much baggage and so much nonsense. It comes with particular clothing that people are wearing, particular style, particular hair. Men are wearing long hair and there's beads hanging out of them and all of that. Chanting and all of that. Forget about all that stuff. That's, you know, that's not making it accessible to anybody. I just sit down, I lie down, or I can just simply sit there and have my eyes open. So, for example, if I'm at a conference and there's a speaker in front of me and I'm next I will actually use my time to self-regulate before I go out on stage. Now, the key about this is that nobody sees anything. And that's the beauty about it. I don't want to show the spectacle. I want to be able to self-regulate without anybody knowing. You know, sometimes with breathing, we think it's all about the spectacle because it's good for social media. Or, you know, people who are in meditation, they're in this absolute perfect lotus position and there's this and that and the other. Forget about all that. That's, for me, I was going to say it's crap. Yeah. But... You know, I don't want to alienate people who are into it. Let them, whoever, whatever people are into, they are into. But we have to think about the normal individual. How do we make breathing accessible to them? Because breathing, it's so powerful. It's been in Europe for 50 years plus. But why only about three or four percent of the population know about it? Because it hasn't been put out there in a way and a manner that's accessible to people. You know, like states of mind. Coming back to meditation, I have seen people having perfect formal posture. They look serene. And yet when they come out of their meditation and they go into their everyday life, they're nut jobs. They're all over the place. Now, it's not about the image. Forget about that. How do you conduct yourself in your normal day to day activities? We have a choice as human beings. We are either stuck in our head or we are not. And I'm not talking about being in our mind and thinking about practical purposes, there is a time to think, to make decisions, you know, to plan, to to question. There's a time to think and that's very practical and that's very important for human beings because we do have to think things through. But there's a time to stop thinking. The problem is that we have developed the, the, the thinking mind into such an instrument involved with thinking we just cannot stop thinking. Our education system has trained us how to think for 12 or 14 years. It has trained us how to think, but it hasn't given us the tools to be able to bring a quietness and a stillness to the mind because if we are living our life stuck in our head, it's not a nice place to be. The human mind is not a nice place to be. It's, yeah. it, it's you know, I mean, it can be on. unless, but you also got to be able to get out of it. Like you say, I mean, you have to be able to think, but if you're not in balance, you can start overthinking and that little voice in your head is not nice, you know? Well, it's like how many, we're all, we all have a tendency to overthink. Yeah. You know, it's 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 almost that it's, a, and there's nothing new about this. But the society is not supporting that trend, you know, with increasing distractions and social media and okay. all kinds of bullshit. But Mads, this has been around for thousands of years. If you think of Buddhism, Buddhism, in my opinion, originated in a quest to help to bring a stillness to the mind and to quieten the thinking mind. But so did um, Christianity. You know, if we yeah, think yeah. of the, the, the origins, yeah, yeah. at the core of all of the major religions. But in if you were to break it down, it's actually so simple. Stop thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So stop thinking. Okay. And you say, well, that's not so simple. Well, in actual fact, it's not that hard if you compare the alternative. What's the alternative? living stuck in your head, totally isolated from life. You can't live life. Like, I was that individual. And this comes back to the first question. 
the maths teacher or the person who talks about the simplicity. I did have a racing mind. It's so common. Um, you know, Ireland economically in the 1980s was a really deprived area. Most I remember a school teacher saying to us when we were in school, how many of you are going to emigrate? And three quarters of us put up our hands. That was Ireland in the 1980s. And, you know, so you can imagine a situation that you have a, a country of economic deprivation. And I was a driven individual and I wanted to escape that. And I pushed myself and I pushed myself and I pushed myself. I left school originally at 14, never to go back. And the reason being was because I wanted to open my own supermarket. So that's why I left. I was working in a supermarket. The shop was sold. I had to go back to school. And then I put myself to get into one of the best universities in Ireland. And I got that. But it came at a price. And it came at a price that I sacrificed everything to achieve this goal. And I sacrificed it because I was put into a situation, of course, to be educated. But in order to be educated, you need concentration and energy levels. I didn't have that. I was a mouth breeder, fast breeder, upper chest breeder. Your nervous system is in a constant fight or fight response. I was tired. I didn't have the ability to hone my attention on one thing. And all that time in education, even going to one of the best universities, it's in Europe pretty much, we were not taught how to concentrate, nor were we taught how to deal with stress. So coming back full picture, when I came across breathing, I was lucky enough to, I went to a two hour talk in Dublin in a hotel and it was obviously given by people, two individuals who were in a state that they were immersed in presence. And there's one thing about human beings that when we talk about bringing a stillness and a quietness to the mind, it's not necessarily the words that we are transmitting, Mm -hmm. but there's something else that goes beyond the words. And I don't want to sound too woo-woo here because it's difficult to kind of objectively break it down scientifically. But I left that to our talk and I walked down Grafton Street, which is a street in Dublin. It was the first time that I actually saw the street. Yeah. Now, I had walked that street numerous times and I can still remember. I can remember the colors. I can remember the sounds. I can remember the feeling and I can remember the silence in my head. And it wasn't, you know, it was just different. I didn't really know what was going on, but yeah. I got a taste that I wasn't. Consciousness in, or whatever you want to call it. Aware. It, it, it was almost as if the critical mind had just been put aside for that brief period of time because whatever I'd listened to these two individuals. And it wasn't that I was in a state of hypnosis or anything like that going down the street. But it planted a seed in me that even though I woke up the next morning, I was still back to that racing mind because of the societal pressures for young kids. And I was a teen. Well, I wasn't a teenager. I was a person. I was in my early 20s at the time. You know, that drive to succeed and the pressures that we put upon ourselves. And of course, you know, people, the brain doesn't know the difference between a real event and an imagined event. And when we drive ourselves into that state of go, 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 go. And like Denmark, I think, is different because I do think you have a much better work life balance than we have in Ireland. I think so too. But I, I also, think so. But I mean even here it's the same I mean once you get into it because I also moved back a year ago you can get into it here too and people are into that same mindset here as well because I mean you have the things that you feel are important to you and everything and you stress about them and I I don't know but is it also because the stress that we used to have, that our brains are made to, our reptilian brains and everything, is physical. I mean, run, jump into a tree and swim for your life, something like that. But what we are stressing about is, oh, did I send the fucking email? You know, that's what we are stressing about is just mm. nonsense, basically. Or it's something that our brain cannot, you know, it's not... If you get that stress and you kind of get the energy out by some physical thing or you escape a lion, then the stress is gone in a way. Does it have something to do with that whole thing? Yeah, like the human life has moved at too fast a pace that the human body is not able to keep up with it. We haven't evolved at the same rate of society, if we call it progress. And I do agree with you. You know, the whole advent of emails and internet and everything like that, the idea behind that would have been to to give us more leisure time. But now, of course, our inbox is flooded. 
And, you know, people are on constant on and social media and everything is wanting your attention. And of course, then you have big platforms and big tech giants that know human behavior inside out, back to front. And those individuals and those companies, of course, the purpose is to hold your attention. Now, what's the alternative? This is where there is a role for breathing. And this is where it is so vitally important for people to be given the tools, to be able to bring a quietness to the mind and also realize that, yes, society is having this impact on us. And that, this was the conversation that we had. Like my workload is extreme and I am in this space yeah. of quietness of yeah. the mind. <laughs> and like I was only thinking about it. It's it's extreme in one point, which is good because now breathing is getting harsh or breathing is harsh. And it wasn't that way. When I started off 22 years ago teaching breathing exercises, nobody really wanted to know about breathing, especially in the style that I was doing it. You know, okay, yoga breathing was out there, but I don't teach yoga breathing. I'm teaching very specific breathing exercises based on the functionality and the scientific aspect of breathing. Um, but if I didn't have breathing exercise and if I didn't have a state or an ability to be able to bring a quietness to the mind, I would have been in a severe state of anxiety. I don't think I would have coped with the pressures that is put upon me. So there are always pressures put upon us. Now, we do have some choice over that. And I think at some point you have to feel I'm just tired of it and I just want to make a break. And as you said, you have to learn how to say no. That's not always easy. I think it's very, very important. If You know, if you keep on saying yes to everybody else, you're saying no to yourself, you know, and I am getting better at that, but none of this is easy. But then again, we have to weigh up what's the alternative. Like, I do want to make sure that if I go for a walk in nature or if I go for a drive or if I'm just sitting in my house, I don't want to be flooded with thinking because we already have enough pressures anyway upon us. And I don't want to be putting more pressures on myself. So it's very important to be able to have those tools, those skill sets to be able to get out of your head, bring your attention onto your breath or into the body or into present moment awareness and get out of the thinking mind. Okay, yeah. Do I want to change topic now because we have to move on so we can cover some more topics. Okay. Okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because we have a time limit here. Yeah, But this I is can... the most interesting one, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but okay. I, d I have one very small question Okay. that could be practical for people because it's there will always be some cue for you to, you know, you have to be conscious about the fact that you need to take these breaths or you need to, otherwise you just stay in that stressed mentality all the time. When you walk in nature, or many people when they walk in nature, they have earphones and they look at the screen and everything. Is there something that you have done to yourself that made you signal to yourself, okay, now I have to take a breath? Is there some sort of rule that you've made? Yes, um, there is. And the reason being is because I had a racing mind And it was a, a shit place to be. Mm -hmm. And all it did was drive up my anxiety. And I didn't feel like I didn't never I never felt that I was anxious as an individual. But I was sick of where I was. I was fed up with it. Sometimes a motivator to get out of your head is when your mind is so agitated and you just say that's not right. It listen, there's nothing fundamentally flawed in the human being. Nature hasn't flawed us. We we are not flawed individuals. And why has nature let us down when the tree outside is growing perfectly according to nature? So we then have to realize that there there is another way to it. That we have the we have the ability to be able to bring this quietness to the mind. We are not flawed by nature. And I realized then at one point in my early 20s that my life up until that point living my in my head was not the right thing to do. So so that motivation and at the start, because I remember exactly what you said there, somebody told me to go down to the seaside because I live in the Atlantic Ocean. Go down to the beach and sit there for a half an hour and just look out onto the out onto the waves. Okay. I went I did it. I went down to the beach one Sunday, sat there for a half an hour, got nothing out of it. And the reason being is because I sat there in body, but I was stuck in my head. I couldn't get out of my head. And even if I was to look at the wave, I'd probably look at it for a brief period of time and think about the wave. Oh, lovely sounds. Oh, God, that's quite rough or that's calm or whatever. True and analytical mind. That's not what it's about. 
It's about starting off where you are. And even when you just bring your attention onto your breathing, you might even be still in the thinking mind. There's my breath coming into the body. There's my breath leaving the body. The thinking mind hasn't been put aside at that point. The more you connect with your breathing, the thinking mind then starts to quieten. And then your attention is directly connected with your breath in the absence of thought. Now, to be able to achieve that, just do it gently and it it absolutely will happen. It happened to me. And once I found that the breath was the easier place to start with, and I found that the breathing exercises, the breathe light or the small breath holes or things like that, very gentle exercises that I'd hold my attention, that my mind was more anchored onto my breath. Now, with that, then my next step was bringing my attention into the body. In other words, getting my uh, my attention out of my head. And then the third way, of course, was bringing my attention into present moment awareness. Now, people talk about present moment awareness, and I've heard people talk about it. But I have to ask the question, are they actually experiencing what they are thinking of and talking about? There's a difference between talking about it and communicating it. And there's a difference between the experience of being able to bring your attention fully into what you are doing in the absence of thoughts. Now, that is where all human beings, we have a fundamental right. I think it's our inherent right to know this. So coming back to your question, do I remind myself to to do it? I do it now, probably unconsciously without having to think about it. And the reason being is I have a motivation to do it because I spent 25 years plus living in my head and I didn't like that place. And nobody likes that place. But the thing is that most of us, because the mind activity is happening unhindered in the background, we're not even conscious of how active we our minds are because number one is we're not paying attention to what's going on in the head. We're not observing what we're thinking about. Society isn't really talking about it. The religions, which at the very core, this would have been the foundation, but it got lost and it got lost because man's mind got in the way and ego got in the way. The school teacher is not talking about it. So we have we the only people then who are talking about it are the people who would have struggled with it themselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the school teachers are probably the most stressed people out of all of them. At least in Denmark. Well, I think the education system is not fit for purpose. I am going to say that. Absolutely. I have no qualms in saying it. You know, it, like having a master's degree or having your ability to bring a silence and a quietness to the mind to be in an absence of thought. Now, thoughts arise. OK, but there's a difference between the thoughts arising and the thinking mind. So, you know, even as we're talking about the conversation, it's kind of funny when you talk about it, it tends to bring, well, at least me into stillness. And I don't know if that's the same for other people, but there's absolutely something that, yes, when your attention is moving simultaneously with time, and this is where flow can be replicated. And if our education system just took one step back and say, we need to prepare these kids for life, just Not simple nasal work. breathing. You can do a class in nasal breathing. That would be it's, that would be huge for the kids. It would be huge. And it would be huge looking at these children, their sleep quality, because children with poor sleep or children who are mouth breathing or stopping yeah. breathing or snoring, it's not just their sleep quality is being impacted. Their brain development is being impacted. Yeah. And none of this stuff is new. Like, Jacob, this has been talked about for 100 years plus. People who breathe through an open mouth during sleep, waking up with a dry mouth in the morning are more likely to wake up feeling unrefreshed. Now, if we're going to talk about states of mind, and this comes back to our meditation we were talking about, Jacob, that how can you have a quietness and a calmness to the mind if you don't have poor sleep and if your physiology is all over the place? And that's why mindfulness does not work for the very person who needs it most. Mm. I guess it's actually more than 100 years, right? That it's been about... Thousands of years. It's, uh, yoga and... it's actually in, in the Bible. Uh, I guess it's kind of indirect, but it says in the Bible that uh, God put life into the human body by breathing into the nostrils, something like that, right? Why should he breathe into the nostrils? Yeah, but right? also just in the whole... Yeah, exactly. But also in the whole scheme of things. Trees, they put out uh, you know, oxygen for us to breathe. We put out carbon dioxide for them to breathe, you know? Mm. I mean, there's a whole balance to it. 
And uh, maybe that's why it works when you look at nature, because you look at actually when you just, when you're there, you just get the feeling of how it actually now is. Now they want to deprive the trees from carbon dioxide with the climate thing, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a it's a thing that I've been thinking about. You know, are we depriving ourselves and the environment from carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide by lowering it too much? I don't know. It's just speculation, you know, because you of all know how important CO two is. The thing about carbon dioxide is we produce it internally, mm. so we don't take it from the atmosphere. In actual fact, the so we produce enough. Oh, uh, we produce plenty of carbon dioxide. Um, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is only 0.04% of atmospheric pressure. Is really, really hardly anything. The human lungs and blood needs 5% of atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, you know, in terms of the old thermometer years ago, how much pressure did it require to drive the mercury up the column? So pressure is measured in terms of millimeters of mercury. Um, and we are producing carbon dioxide as part of our metabolism. So as human beings, we eat food, we breathe in oxygen, food meeting oxygen generates energy, and a byproduct of the generation of energy is carbon dioxide. And if we move our muscles more, if we increase our metabolic activity, we produce more carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is coming from the tissues into the blood, and that blood then is coming back to the heart, back to the lungs. We breathe out the excess CO2. But the key is not to breathe out too much of the carbon dioxide. Because if we breathe out too much carbon dioxide from the lungs, we then lower carbon dioxide in the blood leaving the lungs. So this will be hypocapnia. Mm. But I'll go through okay. it because it's mm. close. What happened then? What You're does that close. mean? So what this means is, if I said to you, Jacob, mm -hmm. breathe 10 full breaths in and out through your mouth. During those 10 full breaths, you will get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from your lungs. It, it's very easy to get rid of a lot of carbon dioxide from your lungs. Whatever the pressure of carbon dioxide is in the lungs will determine the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood leaving the lungs. Because gas will go from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So if you lower the CO2 in your lungs, well then the CO2 in the blood leaving the lungs is going to be low. Now as the CO2 is low in the blood, your blood vessels constrict. But also, not just do your blood vessels constrict, because of the loss of carbon dioxide, your blood pH then increases too much. So this is what's called respiratory alkalosis. This in turn causes arousal of the central nervous system, which is including the brain. So now the brain is becoming excited. So we have 80 billion brain cells, and each brain cell is communicating with 15,000 other brain cells. Now, if you hyperventilate, these brain cells start firing all over the place. Now, a brain cell will send a signal to other brain cells, but these brain cells who were receiving the signal must have a threshold high enough to be able to receive the signal. But these brain cells which are sending the signal need to be sending it in a, a correct manner and not to be just firing all over the place. Hmm. If, so it's just shooting all over the place and the other ones cannot receive them. Correct. And if that's the case, then a seizure can occur. So we can bring ourselves into seizures. Does that mean it will uh, like increase the blood flow in the brain? Or what does that no, mean? No, it's the opposite, actually. So I'll give you this example. I was a mouth breather and a slightly faster breather and a harder breather for years. I always had cold hands and cold feet, and I always had brain fog. We have 50,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body. Your ability to influence your blood circulation and to improve your blood circulation is going to be influenced by how hard and fast you breathe. The more air you breathe, the more your blood vessels constrict. The more air you breathe, the more hemoglobin, which is the carrier of oxygen in the blood, holds onto oxygen. People who breathe a little bit faster and harder have reduced blood circulation and reduced oxygen delivery throughout the body and an increased sympathetic drive. And this is where we, we have to be very careful about there is a place for hyperventilation in terms of breathing. But people have to realize that this is not what it's all about. What about your everyday breathing patterns? Because so many of us have a state of chronic hyperventilation. We are not having a panic attack. It just means that our breathing is a bit faster and a bit harder. And that is literally depriving our body of blood flow and oxygen delivery. It is not about the oxygen coming into the lungs. 
It's about that oxygen transferring from the lungs to the blood and from the blood to the tissues. And I'll give you this example. One guy, Iher Varies, just completed a marathon in the United States called Barclays Martin. It's one of the most extreme Martins on earth, running continuously pretty much for 60 hours, but without trails. So literally you are put in, in this wooded area and extreme terrain. There's no trails. All you have is a compass and a map. That's it. No phones, no technology. Your objective is to be able to cover distance. So it's a, it's a physical challenge, but it's a mental challenge in light of sleep deprivation. His training for that was nasal breathing. So he trained, he came across a book that I'd written back in 2015, and he put everything in that book into practice, nose breathing. He did all of his training with nose breathing. By breathing in and out through his nose, he trained his body to perform physical exercise with less ventilation. So by here is the thing with this. I said earlier on, it's not about the oxygen that's coming into your lungs. It's about how effective is your body at utilizing that oxygen. Now, you could say, if I say to you, I want you to do physical exercise, but 20% less ventilation, you would say that that's not possible. It is if you train. And this, that's the thing with nasal breathing. And in actual fact, you can be breathing in 20% less air into your body, but your body can even utilize oxygen better than if you were breathing lots of air in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do and more with less. Do basically. more with less. And yeah. that's what he trained. And of course, with nasal breathing, it's going to improve your memory, your attention span, your blood flow, especially during physical exercise, oxygen delivery to the brain. And the brain needs a lot of oxygen for it to function. Is, is that also why you're a supporter of uh, breath re retention during uh, physical exercise? Is that kind of the same principles? There's a couple of principles, like breath retention, I suppose, depends on how long you, do you hold your breath for. You know, if we think of the breath itself, during inspiration, the traditional theory is that during inspiration, it's more sympathetically driven. There's a slight acceleration in the heart rate. And during expiration, that's more under the control of the body's rest and digest response. So the heart rate slows down. The, the time between heartbeats increases. Now, if we do a breath hold after inhalation, it's more of a stress response. If we do a breath in, breath out, and then we hold, in other words, if we do a small breath hold after exhalation, it's relaxation. But if we do a long breath hold after, after exhalation, that's a stressor. So the whole purpose of doing a long breath hold for physical exercise would be, it's a psychological stress and a physiological stress. If I had an athlete and that individual was sprinting, they will be sprinting and at some point, maybe 30 seconds into their sprint, they go from aerobic into anaerobic. Okay. Their blood oxygen saturation will probably drop down to about 93%. Carbon dioxide won't change. And that individual might sprint and train that way to stimulate anaerobic glycolysis. But I could get another individual here and I could ask them, breathe in, breathe out and hold your breath and start jogging during a breath hold. We will produce an even stronger hypoxic response we will drop their blood oxygen saturation down to about 85% in comparison to 93%. We will increase their carbon dioxide in the blood to about 50 plus millimeters of mercury. This is putting the body into a state of anaerobic glycolysis. And from a physiological stressor, that's going to force the body then to make adaptations to improve the buffering capacity so that the hydrogen ion coming from the working, working muscles gets oxidized, that it gets neutralized. And as a result, then we can de delay lactic acid and fatigue. But it's not just a physiological stress. We also can cause the diving response, spleen contraction. We can help open up the airways. We can improve blood flow to the brain. But I think the biggest one is, before I forget about it, the psychological stress. We are putting individuals into an extreme state of air hunger. Now, we have to be careful with that. Because I, by doing those exercises in the past, and I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago, I have put people into panic attacks. So as human beings, we have three main fears for survival. Very obvious ones. Lack of food, hunger for food. Lack of water, thirst. And lack of air, that's the biggest one. Mm. Hunger for air. So <clears throat> hunger for air 
or suffocation is a primal fear. We are using breathing exercises to give a controlled dose of suffocation to that individual to have them surrender to that feeling of air hunger to train their brain not to react. Now, I think it's something immense and something really powerful that's going on there, but we have to make sure that we give it controlled to the individual. Number one, I don't give anybody over 60 years of age breath holds. Absolutely no way. Because I don't want to put a major stress on them. You know, I think as we, we have to look at breathing exercises the same way as a personal trainer will look at physical exercise. A good personal trainer will develop an exercise routine based on the person's age, their state of health, and their fitness levels. So that's what a good personal trainer will do. If the person is very old, if the student is very old coming in, the personal trainer is not going to ask that student to start sprinting up and down the room. The personal trainer will devise an exercise program to suit that person. We should be looking at breathing exercise the same way. You know, some of us should crawl before we are sprinting. And there are breathing exercises which are more than a sprint. There are breathing exercises which at the moment have become popular that are so extreme that never before in the history of mankind have we been deliberately and purposely lowering our blood oxygen saturation to the point I don't, I am not comfortable with blood oxygen saturation going below 50%. Let's, uh, that would be, okay, I just want to, uh, that would be Wim Hof breathing, right? Well. Or, I mean, the one we were talking about before is, yes. uh, like, a lot of air in, uh, out through the mouth, in and out, yes. hyperventilation, and then take a lot of air in, hold your breath, take it out. That's exactly what you were talking about before that would create a stress response. Am I right? Yeah, well, hyperventilation is more than there's many schools in terms of hyperventilation, like you could have holotropic or conscious breathing. You have Wim Hof. Wim Hof is doing hyperventilation and breath hold combined. And that's combining a stressor and a stressor. Yeah, uh, I... Yeah, it's an interesting I want to add question. to that first because people need to get an understanding of what is occurring and maybe you can help with that. Because Wim Hof, as you say, it's combining the hyperventilation with the breath holding, which is kind of an important note because what happens during the hyperventilation is that oxygen or CO2 drops. And this quick reduction, as I can tell from you, can cause seizures or muscle spasms. But what happens afterwards during the breath hold it's actually the opposite so we release co2 as far as i know which is driving oxygen delivery into the body right <laughs> so it will depend as well how the person is practicing it uh-huh if i have an individual if hyperventilate for 30 breaths during that 30 breaths we'll say they're hard and fast they are going to lower their carbon dioxide no doubt in the lungs and blood. Yeah. And they could lower to the point of going from 40 millimeters of mercury down to 15 millimeters of mercury, a huge drop. And then because of the drop on carbon dioxide, which is the driver to breed, now the alarm to breed is depleted. So when the individual does a breath hold, they can hold their breath for a really long time because they don't feel any sensation to breed because their CO2 is starting off so low to begin with because of the hyperventilation. But because they're holding their breath for a really long time, during that time, their cells continue to extract oxygen from the blood, but they have stopped breathing, so they're not replenishing it. So oxygen now is dropping in the blood. And at some point, if you do it during the third, fourth, or fifth cycle, oxygen levels can go very, very low to the point that the person passes out. I have a little bit of concern with that because I don't think anybody knows what's going on in terms of the brain. And I wouldn't feel comfortable practicing it myself and the reason, if I don't feel comfortable practicing it myself, I'm not going to give it to my students. I think there is a place for hyperventilation. I've heard many, many genuinely really wonderful reports. So we don't know what actually goes on in the brain under Wim Hof breathing. But that's why I wanted to implement this, this is, thing. This needs to be teased out. I don't think it's fully known. We know, okay, normal blood oxygen saturation. If I was to measure your blood oxygen saturation now, it's between 95 and 99%. Okay. If you go below 91%, it's hypoxia. So this is where there's inadequate oxygen at the tissue level. If you go below 88%, it's severe hypoxia. 
If you go into 70% or below, you get disoriented. If you go below 60%, now there's a reduction of blood flow to the brain. If you go below 60 and into 50%, there's a risk of passing out. If you're at the top of Mount Everest, 8,800 and whatever, 43 meters, your blood oxygen saturation is probably down at about 50, 60%. Now, that's Mount Everest, but I've seen some of our own instructors doing hyperventilation and breath holding to their point that their blood oxygen saturation drops down to below 30%. Wow. We, who, and, what's happening there? And that you know? happens during we the don't know. meditation as well. It happens as a result of hyperventilation and lung breath holds. And we don't know what that is, but... I don't think anybody knows. Isn't that reversed as soon as they hold their breath? So it like is, it's, but it's it doesn't short... always come back to... That's correct. It is intermittent hypoxic. Yeah. But I've also... I've attended many, many sleep conferences. And I remember... Uh, it's going back maybe it's a long time ago. I will remember being at a sleep con conference and the doctor put up a brain scan of people, their brains of those who were affected with obstructive sleep apnea. Now, obstructive sleep apnea is when somebody stops breathing during sleep. It's very similar. You know, their blood oxygen saturation is dropping and their carbon dioxide is increasing. And that causes abnormalities in the brain. And I've seen it. And any doctor who is working in sleep apnea, they will know that sleep apnea has a, a, a tremendous stress on the body and brain, you know, and it is implicated in causing neurological conditions such as dementia and other neuro neurological conditions. Sleep apnea is the one where you're like... Uh, Suffocating mildly like, during the night. The way where you hold your breath, you're like... That one? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically obstructive sleep apnea is when the airways collapse. So you hmm. could have an individual and they are snoring and, and then, then their the airway stop. collapses. And of course, air can't come in because this is collapsible. Hmm. So the throat and the, the back of the mouth and where the soft palate meets the back of the throat. So that area collapses, so air can't get in. So now the person is stopping breathing. And because they've stopped breathing, oxygen is not getting in. So their blood oxygen saturation is dropping, 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 dropping. And we have to ask this question. If obstructive sleep apnea can cause brain damage, if one is doing voluntary hyperventilation and long breath holds and having an even stronger impact, even though it is intermittent, and yes, it is controlled. And the other thing I would say is that the frequency of it happening with somebody who is practicing breathing techniques during the day, it's not going to be quite as frequent as somebody that's during obstructive sleep apnea. But here's the question. Does anybody know the dose? And does anybody know the duration of which a normal brain can be impacted as a result of hypoxia? I, I had a discussion with one of your practitioners last year about this, this particular topic um, where I defended the Wim Hof methods. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the discussion was about, but he told me his, his defense was that this uh, that Wim Hof's method is dangerous and can cause brain damage, as you're suggesting now. Um, can I put a caveat to this? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. I have absolutely nothing um, in terms of, I, like, in fairness to the Wim Hof method, it's done tremendous work yeah. in getting people out of their heads. And there are so many positives to it, the work that he has done with breathing. The only thing that I would say to anybody is, if you're practicing something like the Wim Hof method, now it could be any breathing technique, mm. all it has to do is involve hyperventilation and breath holding. Yeah, yep. simple. These breathing techniques have been around for hundreds of years. Wear a pulse oximeter. And if your blood oxygen saturation goes below 60%, stop the practice. Where you have oximeter. to have a buddy with you. Yeah. So a pulse oximeter, if I just get my own. I bought one from the Oxygen Advantage. You can try it next time we are, we're doing it. So it's a very, very simple, accessible device. They only cost about $20 mm. or so. I've seen that before. And... We we would have been using, now initially I was using these with people with COPD because when I was giving them breathing practice, I wanted to make sure that we, so basically there's a little red light and an infrared light. Put your fingernail against it. This one? Yeah, it'll pick up that way anyway. And there's two I'm saying observations one. there. One will be your SpO2. Yeah. Your SpO2 is the fraction of your hemoglobin that's occupied by oxygen. Hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is the main carrier of oxygen in the blood. It's a protein within the red blood cells, and that carries 98.5% of your oxygen. Okay. Where can we see his percentages there? 
I can't see it. It hasn't picked up yet, actually. Is your hands cold? Yeah. Um, try it. Try it this way. And just bend it to you. Okay, let's see here. It's the, oh, now it's doing something in the bottom. I can see it. Definitely measuring my pulse. It's the bottom one we need to look at, right? It'll pick it up now anyway, so it will. So you're looking at the SPO2. Ah, so basically this is, of all of your hemoglobin, 99. How much of it is carrying SP1 oxygen? one yeah. and 56. That okay. must be your, your And 1.3% right? in the bottom. What would you say that is? So the 1.3%, I'm not sure. The, PI. The PI 56 percent. is your heart rate, of course, and your SpO2 as 99, which is normal. So that's normal. Now, and here's another thing. If Jacob started hyperventilating, are you going to really bring in that much more oxygen into your blood? Because you can't, because no. you're already 99% saturated. Yeah. Oh. Now, say, for example, if you were doing hyperventilation, now your blood oxygen saturation will go from 99% to 100%. So even though you're bringing in a lot more air, well, your blood oxygen saturation is only going to increase by 1%. Now, it is true that the PO2 is a little bit complicated. The PO2 is the partial pressure of oxygen in your lungs. And that's determined by your the atmospheric pressure and the concentration of oxygen, which is 21% of the atmosphere. 21% of 760 is 160. So the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere is 160. Okay. We bring in fresh air into our lungs. That fresh air is going to mix with stale air and water vapor. So the PO2 in the lungs is 100. That's all of your oxygen. Now, the partial pressure of oxygen in your lungs is being 100. Oxygen then will transfer from your lungs to the blood via diffusion. So it's very easy because gas will go from an area of high pressure to low pressure. In the blood, 98.5% of your oxygen is carried bound by hemoglobin. So what you're measuring there is your SpO2. So of your hemoglobin, what's the fraction of it that's actually carrying oxygen? Now, if you were to hyperventilate, as I said, it will increase it by one percentage point. Okay. But in the interim, the hyperventilation will get rid of too much carbon dioxide. But uh, wouldn't it then decrease the oxygen saturation? No. The hyperventilation will actually increase the SpO2. And uh -huh. this will be down to two, two reasons. One is that you're taking more air into your lungs. But the second reason is that as you hyperventilate, not only is your oxygen increasing, but your carbon dioxide is decreasing. Yes, exactly. That's and I mean. as your carbon dioxide decreases, there is a curve called the oxygen dissociation curve. That shifts to the left. And as carbon dioxide decreases, hemoglobin holds on to oxygen too strongly. Mm -hmm. And because hemoglobin is not releasing oxygen readily, that's going to further cause your SpO2 to increase. Now, the question we need is, like, we have to ask this question. What is our breathing all about? It's really to get oxygen to be delivered yeah. to the tissues and organs. We're not going to be breathing in air for that oxygen to do a round trip and then we breathe it back out again. But if we hyperventilate, that's more of what happens. If we want our blood to release oxygen to the tissues and organs, we need carbon dioxide. And who made that discovery? Christian Bohr. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where did they make it? Bohr effect. The Bohr effect. And I think it's ironic we're in Copenhagen yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. And I know there's a house with a plaque down at the harbour because yeah. I've seen it a couple of years ago. Pretty close by. And he, he said that as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, blood pH drops and the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen reduces. So if I want to increase oxygen delivery throughout my body, don't hyperventilate. No. Simply put one hand on your chest, mm -hmm. one hand out just above your navel, and gently slow down your breathing to the point that you were under breathing. So Jakob, you're breathing there. Yeah. Okay, so there's your breath in. And there's your breath out. That's a little bit paradoxical, no, I'm by still, the way. I'm still, I think you're I'm too still conscious of it. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm just doing that. Just relax. Now. Just allow your breathing to just to relax. Just breathe as normal. Don't care how you're doing it, by the way. And don't care whether you're breathing abdominally or diaphragmatically or not. I was trying to do a yogic breath. Yes. No, no, no. Can I'm not doing, I'm no, doing What no. I would like you to do is don't worry about where you're breathing into. Because here what we can do is just target the biochemical dimension of breathing. You see your breathing. There's your breath in. There's your breath out. And all I would like you to do now is gently soften and slow down the speed of your breathing. Now you stop breathing. Now you're slowing down your breath. Good. And now have a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. Good. And now a very, very soft and gentle breath in. Good. Even soften a little bit more. Good. 
and a relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. So I would like you to soften it to the point that you have air hunger. It's likely you have air hunger now because I see it in your eyes. And now you're just gently slowing down your breath to the point that you feel that you're not getting enough air. Don't hold your breath. Just gently soften it and relax your breathing. Now, I know it's not easy because you have cameras and everything in front of you. You play with your breathing and you gently underbreathe. You do the opposite to hyperventilation. Because you breathe less air, carbon dioxide can't leave the lungs as quickly. Carbon dioxide increased in the lungs, then will increase in the blood leaving the lungs, will dilate your blood vessels, improve your blood circulation, and increase oxygen delivery. Now your SpO2 is going to drop, probably one or two points. And the reason being is because your hemoglobin is going to release oxygen more readily. Now it can take a little practice to, to get it, but that's normally what we would expect when you really soften and slow down your breathing. Even though you're taking less air into your body, your body now is having increased oxygen delivery. I know that sounds ironic or it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but the best way for people to practice or to get this is to practice it. It's wild how you can just see it because exactly what you say is is true. You get a little bit more feeling like, okay, I want to take a deep breath in or something like that. Air hunger, right? Yes. And the air hunger is not because your oxygen is dropping. You know, when when very often when people feel they've got, they're reducing their breathing and they feel that they're not getting enough air, they think it's because their oxygen has dropped. No, the sensation of air hunger signifies the carbon dioxide has increased. We have so much oxygen in the human body that our, our oxygen levels have to drop by about 50% before the brain starts stimulating breathing. So breath by breath, as we are breathing sitting here and everybody listening, the primary driver to breathe is carbon dioxide. And when you breathe a little bit less air, carbon dioxide is accumulating in the lungs because it's not leaving the body quickly enough. And the objective of that is to gently soften and slow down your breathing to the point of air hunger. And over time, you improve your tolerance to carbon dioxide. With increased tolerance of CO2, your body is less sensitive to the gas carbon dioxide accumulating in your blood. And as a result, then the drive from the brain to breathe is going to be reduced. So now the person during rest is going to breathe lighter and slower. They will induce more relaxation. During physical exercise, they don't need as much ventilation. This brings me back to Iher Varies. When you think of an individual being able to do extreme ultra running Martins and the previous race was 717 kilometers he did, predominantly with nasal breathing, he trained his body to be efficient. We have to think of ourselves like cars. You have a car out there, you could have a big Hummer and it's a, it's a gas guzzler. It takes so much fuel to go from point A to point B or you can have a car which is ultra efficient. That's what we want to do with human beings. Now, here we run the risk if we have an individual who is hyperventilating and doing it a lot of practice of hyperventilation and believing that this hyperventilation, that there's more oxygen roaming throughout the body, that individual runs the risk of increasing their chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. Then they will develop a habit of breathing too fast and too hard all the time. That's going to put them into an increased stress response all the time. They will increase breathlessness. It will affect our sleeping. It can affect the oxygen delivery to the muscles. It can affect our state of mind. It can affect the gastrointestinal tract. It can affect all of the major functions of the human body. So if we're teaching a breathing exercise, we need to teach it to our students. What does this breathing exercise do for that person? And what's more, tailor the breathing exercise to suit that person. Let me just take a piss. I finally got it. I finally understood it <laughs> after five rounds. Okay, we're, we're back. back. And um, yes. Do you know about the uh, back breathing, which is kind yes. of inhaling your own CO2? Inhaling uh, yeah. the uh, the expelled CO2, Can right? Can you explain okay, that? Well, that would be more rebreathing, no? Yeah, kind of. It's you have a paper bag. Oh, okay. So, so ah, you're, so you're oh. back breathing. Yeah. I thought you said yeah. back breathing. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. Back, back is back. You okay, know? let's. Let's so you're just inhaling your own exhaled CO2. Well, there's an example. Okay, so I think most people will be aware that if a person was having a panic attack, the instruction at that point was breathe in and out of a brown paper bag. Yeah, okay. I what heard was, that. What was the purpose of the paper bag? The person having the panic attack was hyperventilating. Because they were breathing too hard and too fast, too much carbon dioxide was leaving the body through the lungs. They were breathing it out. 
The purpose of the bag was capture the carbon dioxide, rebreathe the carbon dioxide back into the lungs. If you increase CO2 in the lungs, you will increase it in the blood leaving the lungs. This in turn then will increase blood flow to the brain and oxygen delivery, which in turn has a calming effect that neuronal excitability reduces. The brain cell excitability is a really interesting one. Did you know that people with anxiety and panic disorder and depression and mental health problems have increased neuronal excitability? Their brain cells are firing all over the place. And this is not my theory. This has been talked about since 1924. It was known that by rebreathing carbon dioxide into the lungs that it would help to reduce seizures. Mm -hmm. And more recently, a psychiatrist from the United States, Michael Binder, is talking about it. And he's talking about increased neuronal excitability, a paradigm in mental health problems. Now, so the question is, if the brain cells are overly excited, and if that's increasing thought activity, and this kind of comes back to our conversation at the start, I said that mindfulness doesn't work for the very person who needs it the most. Because if the brain is agitated to the point that there's increased neuronal excitability, which in turn is generating so many thoughts, how then can we help to reduce neuronal excitability? And we do that by increasing carbon dioxide. And this, none of this is new. I wrote a book back in 2010. I was working with 3,000 people with anxiety and panic disorders, specifically. I seen the results that we were getting and then what I tried to do was bring the science or at least try and support it in terms of the theory for what I was seeing practically. And I remember reading a paper by Salyum and Balestrino back, it was written back in 1988, and they said the brain by regulating breathing controls its own excitability. I'd forgotten about it, I did, it's in the book, and then I was listening to Dr. Andrew Huberman talking about it. And he said the exact same quote. So we have to think that we can influence, we can reduce neuronal excitability. And I think that's so vitally important. We have control over our own brain. What happened in that study with the panic attacks and the anxiety attacks? Yeah. So in terms of Binder's paper, so he's putting it out there specifically that people with mental health, he looked at the psychiatric population. 75% of the psychiatric population have either severely or very severely elevated brain cell excitability in comparison to about 10 to 15% of the normal population. Which is where the neurons fire. If the neurons are firing okay. all over the place. Okay. And then we have to ask, well, if the neurons are firing all over the place, can we help to reduce that? And it's known, and this comes back to the panic attack. You were talking about breathing in and out of the brown paper bag. Now, by the way, the brown paper bag is not safe if the person continuously breathes in and out. Yes, it is capturing carbon dioxide, but oxygen can't get in. Yeah, there must be a time limit for the practice, right? Five breaths or so. Wow. But what I would say is, if somebody is having a panic attack, cup your hands. So you simply cup your hands, put them on your face. And the whole objective here is don't breathe fast and shallow because fast and shallow breathing reduces gas exchange. So if you are so having a panic attack, or it has to be nose. Okay. So hands here and to breathe silently. Well, you know, if, of course, if the person is having a panic attack, our objective is to slow down our breathing. So you're breathing in through the nose. One, two, three. 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 Now, what I did there was simply worked at slowing down the respiratory rate from if it's 20 breaths per minute down to 10 breaths per minute. Now, if you were feeling lightheaded from doing that, the volume of air that you were breathing in with each breath was just too much, even though you were cupping your hands and pulling carbon dioxide. Would it be an advantage if it's possible for people with an, a panic attack to, to slow it down even more? Instead of the three, three, so five, five, maybe? During the during the part that they are having a panic attack, they're really feeling air hunger. Yeah. And if we reduce their breathing too much, the air hunger might just put them into a greater panic. So let's look at that question. If we have, when I see people coming into me with panic disorder and I look at their everyday breathing, their everyday breathing is not good full stop. Their breathing tends to be noticeable, tends to be upper chest, they often feel they're not getting enough air. Their breath hold time, the bolt score that we use, is usually low. Not always, but usually low. 
we know it's reported that 75% of this group have poor breathing patterns. And my objective with that person who is prone to panic disorder is improve their everyday breathing. Don't breathe fast. Don't breathe shallow. Don't breathe hard. Don't breathe mouth. Practice breathing light. So we focus on light breathing first of all. So that's about the biochemical dimension of breathing. We start them off with small breath holds. I have to be very careful about how much of a dose of air hunger I give them. If I give them too much of an air hunger dose, I put them into a panic attack. And the reason being is because every time that they have a panic attack over the years, it has been associated with a feeling of suffocation. Now, when I give them breathing exercises, which are creating that same degree of suffocation, it could bring on a panic attack. Mm. So I need to give them a teaspoon a teaspoon of air hunger, but not a bucket full. So it brings up the trauma that they have that's and nothing do. to do with the breathing that can put them into the panic attack. Correct, because they can have a very strong alarm towards the feeling of air hunger. Now, they don't call it air hunger. They call it suffocation. But I want to desensitize their body's reaction to that. So from a psychological point of view, we can help them to train them to be able to cope better with air hunger so that if they feel it then in their normal everyday life, it doesn't trigger the same fear response, which in turn could drive a panic attack. But that's only part of it. I also want that person to be breathing light, slow and low. Nose light, slow, deep. And deep not taking full breaths, but deep just meaning that they've got good recruitment of the diaphragm. If I have, I'll typically start with breathing light because we can improve blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. Really, really important. Breathing light helps to reduce the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. Then their everyday breathing is lighter and slower. That makes them more resilient or helps to bring better balance to the autonomic nervous system that they are not just teetering on the brink of symptoms. If you have somebody who is prone to anxiety and panic disorder, if that person is breathing a little bit too fast and hard and upper chest all the time, it doesn't take much of a stressor to push them over. Let's get their underlying breathing better. Then they are better able to cope with the challenges of life. So on one aspect, we want to improve their everyday breathing. But on another aspect, if they do have a panic attack, to give them the tools to be able to get themselves out of the panic attack. Which is this one? That's one of them. So this one is one. Slow breathing, of course, with that, and ideally low breathing. Now, it's not always easy. If somebody was having a panic, I was giving a course there about two weeks ago. One of the gentlemen took a panic attack in the class. I had to go straight to it. Now, this was my first time meeting him. So I had to go just straight to him. Like I raised my voice to take control of the situation. I got him to cup his hands. I didn't care whether he was breathing this way or this. I just wanted to do two things cup his hands and slow down the respiratory rate. Because with that, I can pull carbon dioxide when his hands are cupped. And when I slow down the respiratory rate, I can improve gas exchange. So my objective is to get as much blood flow to the brain and oxygen delivery as possible. So then the brain will quieten and that will take him out of his panic. And it did. But I think I think it I think it's also related to of course that's a physiological thing in in lowering your breathing rate uh, to reduce the panic attack, but also like we talked about earlier, according to the meditation thing, that you are shifting your focus from the panic attack to your breath. Don't you think that? Yes. So I think your point there is that the fear response with the panic is only going to drive more panic. I just think that... It's like a vicious circle. Yeah. And I would agree with you. Because I actually regularly have small panic attacks. I suffered 10 years ago from anxiety and I'm dealing brilliantly with it now. But when I'm flying, for example, and, and there's turbulence, I can still get these triggers, you know? And as you say, I can... If I control my breathing, comes into a parasympathetic state, it's like this state is controlling my thoughts as well. So the panic thoughts that I had slowly disappears. But whether that's a physiological response or whether the response is because I'm shifting my focus from the panic uh, attack in the flight situation to my breathing. It's both. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter once it works. Doesn't mm. it also you have yeah, 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 to do sure. something with, because, I mean, you have this book, uh, but, I mean, in yoga, for instance, 
it's also the you know coming to terms with the fact that you can't control you can't control the 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 plane like i get the kind of the same yeah, yeah. because you can't control it you know and when something is out of your control that's when you can kind of panic you're like fuck i i have no control over the situation and that's when you need it but that's mental that's a psychological thing in a way which can then trigger the panic which then the breathing then enforces the panic which then you know yeah, and then it when goes it both starts ways. yeah so is it also a mental thing of just like letting go of control and just maybe just focusing on the breath is that a big part of it as well I think there's a couple of things you know I think it gets easier with experience yeah you know the more you fly the easier it becomes uh the second thing is it doesn't work for me <laughs> look <laughs> look at, look at the air hostesses <laughs> look at the what? Look at the air hostesses. Ah, uh, so mm-hmm. this, this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the workers. That helps definitely yeah, because you know they're so calm. They're so calm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. and I think it oh, it, can be, it can mm. be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Misinterpreted. So, yeah. But yeah, because like. I travel a lot, um, and 15 years ago, of course, turbulence. I don't think anybody likes turbulence, especially if you're kind of just new, relatively new to travel. Um, but I used to find it was helpful if I looked at there. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Sure. If you if you have a big problem, you will see it in their faces. But no, no, they're always calm throughout. Um, I think it's always very important, you know, in terms of having a strategy that works for you. If it works for you, brilliant. And that's the thing about any breathing exercise. There's no one size fits all, but having kind of an overview of the exercises that are doing specific, some specific purpose, and then you choose, well, which one is going to work for me? So you might have some people who are in turbulence, they might do small breath holds. Some people might slow down their breathing to six breaths per minute. I typically, if I'm in a situation and I want to bring down my heart rate, I will just take a soft breath in through my nose and a really relaxed, slow, gentle breath out. I don't time it. All I do is just bring a feeling of relaxation to the body. Is that also connected with the, I mean, to me, I, with the air hunger? I mean, if you feel the air hunger, that's a good thing. Air hunger can be a good thing when it's controlled. Yeah, and to I mean, the point, mildly. This is the thing about air hunger, okay? If we do just the right dose of air hunger, it actually induces relaxation. How do you know? You know by the saliva in the mouth. So tomorrow we have 400 people, okay? I will have them all do this breathing exercise tomorrow. I would say that 80 to 90% of them will have increased watery saliva in the mouth. So we know that even though air hunger was uncomfortable, it's not stressful. And even though they feel uncomfortable because of the air hunger and the need to breathe, well, it's actually inducing a relaxation response because they will feel sleepy and they have increased watery saliva. So if we think of the rest and digest response, how do you know if you switch it on? Well, rest, you feel sleepy, digest, your body is ready for the digestion of food, yeah. and it prepares more saliva. One group of people, I might put them into the air hunger, but that air hunger might bring up trauma and panic. Their heart rate increases and their mouth goes dry. It's the same exercise, but a different response. So I will give kind of a, a not a warning, but a note of caution to the group of people. And I would say, if any of you here have a history of panic disorder and anxiety, I want you to only do air hunger for about 30 seconds. And at 30 seconds, go back to normal breathing. Whereas the rest of the group, I will have them do it for four minutes. Always think about breathing exercises. What's the dose that you want to give the person? So with this, the air hunger is tolerable, but what's the duration? One group, I will give four minutes. One group, I will give 30 seconds interesting in seeing it that way as a dose you know mm. but, but that's what it is it's i mean exactly. to an extent i mean it's medicine it is like a medicine well, it's the same as a, your personal trainer you yeah, know yeah, so a personal trainer will say well here is a here is a physical exercise routine for Sets you and reps yeah, but I it's even more ten, it's ten even minutes of walking yeah, yeah, you know yeah. you might have somebody who's totally out of shape and you say listen let's start off with 10 minutes of walking per day mm-hmm. at least we're getting it started but it's even way more crucial than physical trainer because yeah, that's is. a part of the physical training as well yeah and it's so much more subtle and so much more you use it every second of every your life every second of yeah. and if you can see these signs and if you know these things you can actually i had no idea it was that deep in a way i mean not before you explain it that way. That's so interesting. In the mornings, is actually something I think a lot about myself. 
would you because sometimes i do cold exposure in the morning sometimes i start my day with uh, with box breathing for example would you do an acute stressor like cold exposure or would you do some parasympathetic breathing should we remain in a state of calmness or should we just get going i think the question to that is how is the person this comes back Depends. to the conversation that we had earlier on i think okay. it's a really really good question you know the black and white answer would say you wake up in the morning you have to upregulate i don't agree with that i would some people you do and some people you don't if somebody is waking up feeling lousy i want them to downregulate first i will tell you my routine yeah mm-hmm. i wake up in the morning i have a gym at our studio so i have a number of different machines there my per- my personal one is just a co- cross trainer i will go on to the cross trainer at about six o'clock in the morning i just do 30 minutes in and out through my nose with my attention dispersed throughout my body and sometimes i even do the exercise with my eyes closed now i'm not going to fall off it <laughs> because it's a cross trainer it's not like a treadmill my reasoning being there is because i don't have time to do formal practice of breathing exercises meditation and physical exercise so i make my physical exercise also a training for my breathing and a training for the brain so i'm doing i am doing the cross trainer when my mouth is closed my tongue is resting in the roof of the mouth i'm breathing in and out through my nose i'm breathing light i'm breathing slow i'm breathing low this is my down regulation so i have down regulation but i've also up regulation because i'm moving my body my body is producing more carbon dioxide that carbon dioxide that increased co2 is coming back to the lungs because my mouth is closed, the carbon dioxide is not able to leave the lungs so quickly. So the carbon dioxide then is increasing in the lungs, which is increasing in the blood, which is improving my blood circulation, which is increasing blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. This is helping to quieten the mind. I'm also shifting my attention as I do my physical exercise, and I want to do my physical exercise with every cell of the body. I think there's wasted and missed opportunities. You know, how many personal trainers are working with their clients and all of the emphasis is on physical training? What about mental training? What about getting a person to do their training with every cell of the body? Don't just do your physical exercise with your head being disconnected from the body. This is a tremendous opportunity. You do your physical exercise with every cell of your body. You do your physical exercise with your attention on the breath, with your attention in the body, well, now it's going beyond training for the body. It's a training for the brain. Very important. So no watching TikTok while you're on the treadmill. No, because when Mouth I get breathing, it, you know, <laughs> and like, and I, like, listen, I get it. And I see the, the enticement, you know, um, yeah. in terms of people listening to, but then all of your attention is going outwards. Yeah. And on yeah. this TV screen or whatever. That's a, they big, do. That's a big, big thing actually now. I think maybe that's the biggest hurt if you look at the big picture of the attention because the attention has to be on the breath. Otherwise, you're not feeling the air hunger. You're not feeling the situation and what's happening in your brain. You can't be doing it while you're doing something else unless you're doing the workout, of course. Well, think about this, Jacob. I think the most important trait that any of us as human beings have is our ability to concentrate and our attention span. And that's why I was saying the conversation we had at the very start, that's the nuggets of this podcast. Anybody who comes in through my door And I'll tell you like the origins of Oxygen Advantage. I was giving courses in Ireland. Ireland was in a bad place economically 2010. So as many other countries. We had a lot of anxiety. I put together functional breathing and mindfulness to bring the two together. So I was teaching mindfulness and I was teaching functional breathing and improving people's sleep. The courses were popular. 3,000 people attended over the course of two, three years. 95% of them were female men were not attending. The reason being is because I had I had anxiety and panic disorder in, in the title. I started writing then a book and my whole aim of that book was to bring breathing into the mental and physical performance aspect because then it would attract people to come in the door. And once they were in the door, then I was giving them the tools to get them out of their heads. So with Oxygen Advantage, I would say that 50% of our training is breathing and 50% is getting people out of their heads and into the body and developing the capacity to be able to hone attention. Now, when we think about concentration, what is it? Concentration is your ability to hold your attention on one thing in the absence of distraction. 
that you're not looking through, your energy isn't directed through this veil of thinking. Because your energy is not that you're just looking at it. Okay, I'll give you this example. You could be reading a book, as I would have been for years, and my eyes are looking towards the text. So to an outside observer, they think I am reading the book. My eyes are looking at the text, but it doesn't mean my attention is on that. My attention could be stuck in my head. And I could be reading that and I'm lost in thought. I get to the bottom of the page, I remember nothing of it. Mm -hmm. That's not concentration. That's me. That's concentration me. <laughs> is your ability to hold your attention there exclusively. That 100% of your attention, that you're fully immersed in what you're doing. Now, if somebody can develop that skill, they have it for life. And their quality of work, regardless of whatever they apply themselves for, it will be a good quality of work because you can't you can't produce good quality of anything if you're just going through the motions. You know, if you go into the gym and you're looking at TikTok, which is a load of nonsense, you know, you're looking at this and you're you're doing something, but you're not giving yourself any attention. It's no good. So we should be thinking about, you know, how do you if you're practicing distraction all day long, how are you going to be focused when you need it? And we grow as human beings. We learn about ourselves through the challenges that we put ourselves into. Of course, not to have too high a challenge that it scares the life out of us, but not to have too low a challenge that it doesn't motivate us. I have an advantage over the two of you because I'm probably at least two decades older than you. So I have been along this journey. And when I look back and I was saying to myself, like if I was to say to myself when I was a 20 year old, you know, I feel a very good sense of contentment as a human being because I put myself out there and I grew with it. I put myself into challenging situations. I was successful if the, whatever definition of success is and only successful. It's not about the money. That's for me is not success. What I would regard as success is that I had a particular skill set that I loved. And because I loved it and I had a passion for it, I was able to develop it and to grow it and it became almost my DNA. So, you know, in terms of work life, I think, yes, I have had some degree of success in that. Now, I will say this, I would never have achieved anything near that success if I didn't have the capacity to be able to direct my attention. And this comes back to the first question. Our education system is not teaching us this. And it's not just, okay, so we talk about people with anxiety and panic disorder and even racing mind and lost in thought. You know, the, the, an athlete or somebody comes into my door. Okay, they're coming in my door because they're, they're looking for breathing for physical performance. I will spend at least half the time getting them out of their heads. And the reason being is because the courage in this instance is to be able to reproduce flow states, that you're fully immersed in what you're doing, because this is a state of bliss. It's a tremendous state where the right action is happening by yourself, by itself. Your attention is moving simultaneously with time. But in order to achieve that state, your brain is trained, or at least you have some degree of control over your thinking or whether you're lost in thought or not. Now, once you develop that, you also have to develop it, develop, you also have developed the capacity to step outside of thought. That's very important because I have developed the capacity not to be anxious, not to be lost in my mind, not to be having, I don't think that I have a risk of depression mm -hmm. because my, I can step in when I notice that my mind has gone a little bit too far if I'm ruminating. And I'm, I feel then that I'm not going to run the risk of ruminating myself into the ground. And we, you know, this is like, okay. So on one hand, you're, we're talking about flow and we're talking about mental performance. But of course, the, the things that we learn to achieve flow, those same traits will also help keep us out of trouble, reduce our anxiety, reduce our high stress, reduce our depression. Yeah. And I mean... I also think we talked to a guy with cancer stuff. Stress is also the number one reason for stuff like cancer. I mean, it's not only the panic attacks and the thing, it's many more things that comes because it in, in, it increases inflammation in your body and stuff like that, you know? Totally, totally. And it's it's known since 
1998 that if you stimulate the vagus nerve, you can you can have to block pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so there's a neuroscientist from New York called Kevin Tracy, and he was working on rats doing experiments, and he said, well, his his hypothesis was if I can stimulate the vagus nerve in the rat, I can reduce inflammation. And his colleagues were outside in the corridors betting, making bets that it wasn't going to happen. And he showed it could. Now, again, I totally agree with you. Stress is a killer. Okay, so the hypothesis was that uh, stimulating the vagus nerve could reduce cancer growth. No, stimulating the vagus nerve could reduce inflammation. Okay. And and how how is that interconnected? Because stress contributes to inflammation. Okay. And inflammation is making us sick. So then we have to ask is, in terms of the vagus nerve, how can we stimulate the vagus nerve? And the vagus nerve can be stimulated by changing our breathing patterns. The vagus yeah. nerve is exactly, can you remind? So the vagus nerve is a nerve that wanders throughout the human body. Mm-hmm. It innervates all of the major organs, for instance, the diaphragm. And all of the information of the, not all of it, 80 to 90% of the information by the vagus nerve is from the body up to the brain. So we have this nerve, which is wandering. So vagus comes from the word vagabond, vagabond, Ah, wandering. Okay. So it's a wandering nerve that's feeling, (laughs) I lost vagus. So that's wandering as well. (laughs) No, not that way. (laughs) So you've got all of this information going from the body up to the brain. But it's known since the early 1900s that if you stimulated the vagus nerve, you caused the heart rate to slow down. Because by stimulating the vagus nerve, it secretes a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So that's why, you know, when we were talking about, say, high performance, if you go into a situation and you feel that your heart rate is elevated, if I go out on stage and if I feel my heart rate is too fast and too strong, I want to bring this down. What do I do? I just take a soft breath in through my nose and the really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out, I don't time the the exhalation. The key is the exhalation, not the inhalation. I don't time it because I want to soften and slow down my breathing relative to how I'm breathing at that point. We all breathe differently. Does that make sense? Depending on the situation. If I slow down the speed of the exhalation, it stimulates the vagus nerve. That secretes acetylcholine. That in turn is causing the heart rate to slow down, but also by stimulating the vagus nerve, it's helping to block pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are the chemical messengers that trigger inflammation. So changing our breathing patterns, we can reduce the risk of inflammation. Mm. So that's basically how the vagus nerve is linked to the parasympathetic nervous system activation, right? It's entirely under that umbrella in terms of parasympathetic control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Super interesting, yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know. Uh, I think we're a bit over time. We don't want to take all your energy for tomorrow. Your time. Time. I we could I could go on for an hour or more, but we got a big day tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we need to respect all of your us, but energy. especially you. Yeah, um, so a big day later on today. Actually, yeah, as well. you have some book signings, right? And I think I talk for an hour or an hour plus. So, and you in that ten ten p.m. I, it finishes at ten o'clock tonight. I'm not. I have no idea what I'm doing till ten o'clock, but yeah. I know I get collected at half three or three o'clock. Yeah. So. Big yeah. respect for your for your for your it's so driving good. force and and your ability to and collecting the information because I feel like but that's passion and that's an ability to concentrate, like we talked about. I I think that's your that's your key. But it's also just boiling it down to the most fundamental thing, you know. I mean, because I remember I've been on these yoga retreats and these things. It's the same kind of thing that they're trying to say, and you know, and and uh, they. It, it, it doesn't come across in the same way because it doesn't translate into what we live in. I mean, when you talk about the vagus thing and you can explain that and then this hemoglobin and then you have this, then it translates, you yeah, know, and then like, you get it. How the fuck do you recall so much information? I struggle with that a lot. You know, recalling all of the ins- information that I've learned throughout the ten, uh, last 10 years. I think that's a gift. I don't know. Um... No, it's not a gift. It's, it's 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 of course something you but can in learn. Terms of, but, but yeah, know. I think so. Like I I think you hit the nail on the head. I was lucky. I found a career that absolutely suits my skill set. Yeah, I was so fortunate. But I don't think I would have found it unless I was bringing a stillness and a quietness to the mind. So I remember when when I spoke about I was in that hotel room listening to these two individuals. They were in a state of presence. 
they planted in me a seed knowing that there's a better way in terms of states of mind than what I had experienced up until then. Because they gave me that taste that, you know, I could be in a state that my mind was much, much quieter. And of course, with a quieter mind, my senses then are on what's going on around me. So I'm more immersed in life as opposed to being living in my head. I was always living in my head. I would walk down a street and see none of it. Yeah. But it's not just that you're walking down a street and see none of it. You don't even relate to people. You yeah. could be in a school, in a classroom environment. The teacher is up on the board. You're not paying attention to what the teacher is doing because your attention is stuck in her head. Now, so when I was immersed in that, that planted a seed. I actually started that on my quest. And with that then, and the driving force for that was because I didn't like being where I was. That was simply the driving force. So I really, really did work on helping to bring some quietness to my mind. And it wasn't that I was here and I want to be there, you know, but I will say this. Life will direct us in a certain way when we're not resisting it. And I know this can sound for a little sure. bit. Woo -woo, no, 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 for sure. But I found myself when I was bringing a quietness to my own mind, it was amazing the number of helpful events that, that came yeah, my yeah, way, yeah. way. And I will also say intuitively, I got a good feeling like I got an intuitive sense when I was driving from Galway to Dublin. It was at the time it was about three hours of a of a car journey. Like it's a, from west to east in Ireland. And I got a sense when I was doing that drive that I should be teaching or love teaching breathing exercises. Now, can you imagine, OK, I'm just after completing an economics and business degree mm -hmm. from a university that I worked so goddamn hard. And that I found was a challenge all the way through. And then all of a sudden to get an overwhelming sense to leave everything behind and to start relearning a total new skill set going into an area that I knew nothing about, but that was good instinct. And it gave me an overwhelming sense that this was the right thing to do. But if I was to overthink it, I wouldn't have done it. So sometimes the overthinking mind will absolutely sabotage us and it does sabotage us. If you have a message that you feel that it's absolutely the right thing to do and it's based on gut, go for it because that does not let you down. Now, you might say, well, is it the right thing? Is it the not? If you are running it over and over and over in the mind, it's not right for you. So it's an overwhelming sense that it's the right thing to do. But I will say this, it came into my mind. That's a thought, but it came in because I was practicing stillness of the mind up until then. And we need to have some space between the thinking to allow the intuitive and creative thoughts to emerge. Before that, I was constantly going from one thought to another, lost in my thinking mind. There was no space for anything new, creative, intuitive. And even if it did come in, how did I differentiate that thinking from all of the nonsense that was going on in my head? Yeah. And you get lost on your path. What is the right thing to do and what is the wrong? Correct. Because your your mind, the human mind, like we have to think of this filter, this organ, whatever it is, everything that we experience in life is interpreted through this filter, the mind. And yet we are not given the tools to adequately be able to work with this and, and working with it. And I'm not talking about doing a PhD on the mind. People are doing a PhD on mindfulness. Forget about that. You could do a PhD on how a banana tastes. I want to bite into the banana. I want to taste it. I want to experience it. And that way, if you can experience it, I think it's easier to convey it because it's not always the easiest subject. You know, there's a simplicity about the mind. We are overthinking. The solution is, as we said at the start, stop thinking. If it was that easy, everybody will do it. But I will say it is easy. It is easy. It is easy and it's not easy. It's simple and it's not simple. And but what's the alternative? And every moment that we spend, if we spend two seconds out of our head and on our breathing, well, that's two seconds out of our head. Start with that. I have a million questions still. Yeah, <laughs> Me too, but we will. We have to finish it. But we have a part three as well. We have to have, yeah, yeah, because I have to ask you There's about so much the heart. I've have you heard about heart methods? Oh, we can't. Oh, no, yeah, yes. no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's another one. That's yeah, but at least one. I have. But that's all interconnected with what we talked about. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. but like also yes. intuition, because what about the electromagnetic field that the heart creates, which is way bigger than your brain? How did you even know that those two people that you met were present? It's not because they told you, hey, I'm present. I didn't. Mm. But it was you when I walked it. down the street, I felt that something had happened. Exactly. Yeah. And how did, because they do in the studies with, with these things, uh, with the finger thing and meditation, that the electromagnetic field, when you do the right breathing, uh, increases the electromagnetic field around your heart and it influences the people living in the same building, even you've never even spoken to them, which is super interesting. Anyway, not for this episode. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. For next one. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Joe Rogan. I really think that you deserve a spot right there because you are, yeah, you, you have a brilliant mind. And I think you are the leading expert of breathing globally. And um, yeah, I'm proud to have you here, at least. It's a pleasure. Thanks and I'm very looking much. forward to tomorrow. We're looking nice. forward to tomorrow. Great. To learn a lot more. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much, Mads. Good. Jacob. All right, Patrick. Thank you. Great. Very nice. <laughs>